really is a pleasure uh, to introduce a guy from all the way across the country, from the great state of Delaware, uh, who, although he is from Delaware, um, is a Stanford kind of guy because his bachelor's degree is in chemical engineering, all right, and it's magna cum laude, all right, and that's the kind of background that people in uh, Silicon Valley um, uh, tend to appreciate. Um, the Honorable John Noble has been a vice chancellor in the Court of Chancery since November of 2000. Uh, as I mentioned, his bachelor's degree is in chemical engineering from Bucktail. His law degree is from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, following law school, he clerked as a federal district court uh, clerk um, and then practiced with Parkowski, Noble, and Gorky uh, in Dover, Delaware for several years uh, before being elevated. Is that the right term by the governor? Before ascending? Um, yeah, I think we'll go with ascending. Before ascending, before ascending um, to the role of being uh, vice chancellor. Um, being one of the chancellors in Delaware, uh, from my perspective, is one of the best jobs in the whole world. All right, now, why is that? You wind up typically with the most interesting and complicated business law cases that anybody is ever going to see. You wind up having the best, and might I add, often the most expensive lawyers in the world showing up in your courtroom arguing some of the most intellectually difficult cases you're ever going to run across. And the decisions that you wind up reaching in your court are decisions that have impact across the entire United States, are read closely by scholars, lawyers, and judges in many other jurisdictions and in foreign lands. It is one of the best perches in the world from which to influence the evolution of corporate law, business law, and of basic principles that really govern business transactions on a global basis. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you one of the few guys who might have a job better than mine, <laughs> all right, better than teaching here at Stanford, and we'd very much, much like to thank our friends at the Markula Center for helping organize uh, Chancellor Noble's presentation this evening. I give you the Vice Chancellor, John Noble. I can now tell you what is so great about the job. To have an introduction from Professor Grunfest with that much intensity and fervor and fundamental dishonesty uh, <laughs> is, is, is just wonderful. You can say, as, as long as what you say about me is nice, I am perfectly happy and I will not get hung up on whether it is true or not. Thank you all for coming tonight. I am sure with your busy schedules, there are lots of things that you could be doing uh, besides sitting here listening to me. The purpose of my talk tonight is to reflect a little bit about what corporate directors do and try, try to tie that to what goes on, or at least what somebody from the East Coast thinks goes on here. At the core of a corporate director's responsibility to the company and to its shareholders, one finds fiduciary duties. We now have two such duties, due care and loyalty. At one time, we also had the duty of good faith, but it was rolled up into the other two, primarily the duty of loyalty. Due care and loyalty may be defined. The definitions are not precise. The duties are contextual. And that should not be surprising because the concepts draw heavily upon traditional equitable principles. The duty of care essentially asks whether directors have engaged in a reasonable process of decision making and acted on an informed basis. One articulation of the duty of care is that directors of a corporation in managing the corporate affairs are bound to use that amount of care which ordinarily careful and prudent men would use in similar circumstances. We cannot expect corporate fiduciaries to be perfect. Not all of one's decisions, when viewed in hindsight, will be the ones we wished we had made. As a practical matter, the standard is gross negligence. The duty of loyalty, which in light of the comments I tend to make later, 
will be the most important, essentially asks whether a fiduciary has favored personal or other interests over those of the corporation and the shareholders. Thus, the duty prohibits directors from standing on both sides of a transaction and from deriving personal benefit through self-dealing. As one prominent treatise summarizes, it mandates that a director not consider or represent interests other than the best interests of the corporation and its shareholders in making a business decision. Ideally, a director puts the best interests of the corporation and its shareholders first, ahead of his own self-interest, ahead of the interests of others who are friends or allies, ahead of interests of those who hold or could exercise economic or other powers over her. Corporate law affords directors the presumption that they perform their acts on behalf of the corporation with due care and loyalty. That, of course, is the business judgment rule and provides directors with the comfort that they will not risk losing a lawsuit to some shareholder who just had a different view. We live in a world of inconsistency and overlapping expectations, and the world of corporate directors is no different. And this brings me to Silicon Valley and its version of the American dream. Entrepreneurship, risk-taking, creativity, the potential for massive profits, and the obverse, the potential to crater. I use the term entrepreneurship broadly, perhaps too broadly, to encompass multiple players beyond perhaps the true entrepreneur who has the solutions, has the ideas, has the technology, and has identified the application and its market. This may, to some extent, include angel investors, venture capitalists, independent directors, and the like, all of whom seem tied to this business model. The concepts are at work elsewhere in the United States, and for that matter, elsewhere in the world. But at this moment, Silicon Valley, for many of us, is the primary example. What does this energy and focus mean for corporate governance and corporate culture? I come from a small state. Pretty much everybody knows one another or knows somebody who knows everybody else. The potential for conflict and inconsistency is omnipresent. It is something to be conscious of and to deal with. As one of my neighbors put it, in Delaware, you're either related or you've dated. <laughs> but, but Silicon Valley, while larger than Delaware, has the same kind, or so it appears, of interrelationships and allegiances. All of these can lead to conflict or the appearance of conflict. I remember a complaint filed in 2004, and the plaintiff was trying to demonstrate that the chief executive officer of a tech company here in the Valley controlled a board member because of personal influence and friendship. The complaint, and I went back and dug this out, alleged that the two directors, and I start quoting here, friendship runs so deep they purchased homes in the same neighborhood. This is not mere coincidence. They even owned neighboring wineries. This deep-seated friendship sterilizes the director's judgment. Therein is the end of my quote. But I'm thinking when we're talking about wineries, maybe, maybe I am uh, geographically where I should be. Entrepreneurship is frequently marked by fresh thinking, creativity, skepticism about the past, belief in the value of change, and a willingness to question those so-called rules. Some might suggest a touch of rebelliousness. Is it any wonder that some entrepreneurs and venture capitalists seem uncomfortable with the notion of fiduciary duties? After all, our fiduciary duties are easily traced back to medieval England. Time-honored may be nice, but it is easy to think of time-honored traditions that are simply wrong. Racial and gender discrimination are examples. Also, think about how fiduciary duties may impact the entrepreneur. They inconveniently get in the way of maximizing personal wealth. Remember that without the entrepreneur's ideas, inspiration, and hard work, there might be no enterprise. Or without the cash provided by various investors, the enterprise might not have survived. One can understand why entrepreneurs and venture capitalists might chafe at the limitations imposed by fiduciary duties. 
Is Silicon Valley and its sense of entrepreneurialism automatically at odds with Delaware law and its insistence upon fiduciary duties? Is the model of venture capital different from other investment models in which financiers closely monitor and control their investments? Venture capital is inherently a speculative business. The model accepts and contemplates, as does perhaps Silicon Valley as a whole, failure and unsuccessful investments, though, of course, that's not the goal. However VC funds in the aggregate place their bets, they do so expecting a few big winners to offset the losses, or even the net neutral investments, and thereby that's how they meet their profit objectives. Of course, the funds do good in the world by providing a source of capital for emerging companies. New services and technology are brought forth through these mechanisms which provide great rewards for good ideas and effectively pull the plug from those that aren't so good, which were the victims of fate or poor timing. To be sure, I'm not equating entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. They do have different and competing objectives. Their interests do converge. Both seek prompt and material profitability. Although entrepreneurs may seek other sources of funding, their own, for example, or angel investors, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists tend to come together, especially, it seems, here in Silicon Valley. It is for this reason that the dynamic between entrepreneurship and corporate governance often implicates the relationship between venture capital and fiduciary duties. Venture capital is forward thinking. I really thought I had reached the point where my wife walked out on my speech. I thought that, I, I thought that is the ultimate signal that I should just sit down and be quiet. But I, I, Not yet. <laughs> in any event, venture capital is forward looking and inherently invokes, involves risk and likely must contemplate some mechanism by which losses are cut at those business that appear destined for failure, or even where there can be a means of escaping for an investment that is stagnating. Evaluations of a business's prospects must be made without the benefit of hindsight in a live dynamic environment, and sometimes challenging decisions must be made about how to divide what remains of the pie when that particular investment doesn't live up to the expectations. Business achievements may be weighed relative to those of other portfolio companies and other market conditions with all of the imperfections inherent in human knowledge. Delaware law and its fiduciary duties, by contrast, evaluate businesses individually and from the vantage point of each individual business's residual common shareholders. Its focus on a particular corporate constituent is based in part on the theory that the gains to that party will also result in gains to the other parties, and that policy may appear to be somewhat harsh and unforgiving in other uh, circumstances and to other constituents. Even Delaware law in certain circumstances recognizes that fiduciaries may have latitude to consider more broadly corporate constituents beyond the residual common shareholder. Any particular litigated event also has the benefit of hindsight knowledge and allegations may seek to describe contractual circumstances or future events that, advanced, that investors in the heat of in the moment simply could not hypothesize or predict. Thus it may appear that the models could run into conflict based on the expectation of venture capital that it may have to cut its losses. And then we come to the question of if there's such a mechanism through which it could uh, if, if, um, move from that investment. And then we have Delaware's pointed focus on the board's duties owed to the common shareholders. How can this culture coexist with what Delaware law from the other side of the continent expects of corporate directors? What are the risks for directors? Is Delaware law out of touch? That is a question that should be asked. Is it unreasonable? Perhaps wrong. The risks of this debate are the exemplified in a recent decision by one of my colleagues in a matter known as Trados. Trados provides a useful example. It is not my intent to cling precisely to its facts, 
a bit of background may provide some context. Atreides obtained various sources of venture financing from 2000 to 2002. And as part of those transactions, the VC funders received a liquidation preference on preferred stock and were granted board seats for representatives of those financing companies. Uh, by 2002, I think it was five of Trados' seven directors uh, had, were holding seats and they were controlled by the VC funders. The facts of the case indicate that these board members were dissatisfied with revenue growth and after replacing management ultimately decided that a sale of the company was necessary to return their capital. A management incentive plan was put into place which would compensate management for a sale of the company even if such a sale failed to generate payments for the common stock. A sale of the company was brokered, and the preferred shareholders ended up receiving more than their initial investment, though they did not receive their full liquidation preference. Management received bonuses under the management incentive plan, and the common stockholder received nothing. The management incentive plan was viewed as encouraging the executives to protect the preferred stockholders without concern for the common stockholders. Though this is an abbreviated view of the case, the facts also revealed that throughout the process, the board primarily considered the sale of the company and achieving a return on the investment of the preferred stockholders rather than residual shareholder value as Delaware law would typically expect. Because of the conflict of the preferred holders representatives on the board, the case was one of entire fairness. Price and process considered in a unitary fashion. And the burden was on the defendant directors. It does show how directors, when confronted with a difficult problem, can lose the protections of the business judgment rule and are left to litigate what amounted to a battle of experts. The directors escaped without monetary liability, but the outcome was not guaranteed, and one could point to a few changes in the factual background that might have led to a different outcome. The tension is not limited to startup companies in the valley. It can happen just about anywhere. And this is, I think, an important point because this is not a geographically determined issue. It just seems to come up more frequently here. But anywhere you have growing companies where individuals are more concerned about developing or expanding the company now than they are about fiduciary problems that may arise in the future. There is an optimism driving these enterprises, and it seems that fiduciary duty problems frequently don't show up until the enterprise has encountered financial difficulty. By the time of distress, the aspirations of the various stakeholders have been frustrated, and they tend to argue over what is left. For example, I recently had a case involving a real estate development company on the East Coast. If nothing else, this makes my point about these concerns are not limited geographically. A little more than a decade ago, it was in need of cash to fund its expansion. It found a lender willing to invest through a convertible debenture. They gave it a, the status of a creditor with an opportunity to participate in capital appreciation. But the lender wanted a role in management. It negotiated two board seats for itself. The company founder kept two seats for his side, one for himself and one for a second director who was obligated to vote as he was directed. A divided board with no one in absolute control, but the benefit was seen as requiring a co cooperative approach to avoid gridlock. A divided board with no majority of independent directors. The entity was a limited liability company that had minority unit holders, a mix of employees and individuals who had contributed real estate early on. The numbers were fairly small. We know what happened to the real estate market in 2008, but the company was suffering sooner. In 2006, it had many layoffs. It had come to a point where it needed a restructuring, in part because the debenture had, be had become due without having been paid. How the company restructured is not important here. What is important is that minority unit holders were not happy. They viewed the restructuring as depriving them of any value, if they had any value after the restructuring. And then the economic events that followed uh, demonstrated that there was no value. The minority unit holders sued. The lenders' board members conceded that they had been acting as creditors during the restructuring. One can understand why they did. They were candid. 
the, the founder came out of the restructuring with a company of his own. They all had interests to protect, and in a suit by the minority unit holders, there was the risk that their actions would be assessed on an entire fairness basis. Perhaps they had bought the burden of proof. The limited liability company agreement did not eliminate fiduciary duties. It did have a standard for measuring the director's conduct and, ex and an exculpatory provision. The relevant valuation was at the time of the restructuring before the economic downturn. In a sense, the downturn explained the company's unfortunate current circumstances, but valuation must be done at the time of the challenged event, that is the restructuring. And that occurred before the extent of the economic downturn had become obvious. Complicating it all was the simple fact that real estate indicators tend to lag the economy. The case had to be tried. Post-trial briefing is underway. Maybe the defendants will prevail. Maybe they won't. I obviously can't comment, but the expense, the stress, the diversion of time and resources. The trial took a full five days. That all cannot be underestimated. The initial and obvious lesson is to try to avoid conflicted boards. The criteria for independence and disinterestedness are reasonably clear. If only it were that simple. Finding good directors who are willing to serve is not easy. First, new firms are typically not flush with cash. Directors tend not to work for free. Frequently, as in Trados, investors acquire the right to designate directors. The designees have relationships with the investors. Their compensation may come from those investors. The company, as I said, probably doesn't have the funds. When one is designated as, as a director and paid, think of mortgages, think of college tuition and the like, by the investor, how can the designated director be expected to put the interests of the company and its stockholders above the interests of the sponsor? Second, startup companies, at least as a general matter, have a greater chance of failure. A study recently showed that about three-fourths of venture-backed firms in the United States don't return the investor's capital. The ex liability exposure of a director tends to expand when the, the company is having financial problems. That induces directors to look for some backstop to, for their indemnification, and that leads right back to the investors who are the source of the conflict. Third, simply identifying a director who can serve is sometimes a challenge. Going beyond one's Rolodex, and here I guess I'm showing my age, can be stressful. Just finding the person who's the right person to serve is, is a problem. Finally, startups frequently have a narrow focus. Directors must understand the technology and its commercial application. And that presents another conundrum because you can have folks who are perfectly qualified to be directors in a sense, but without having an understanding of a particular industry, their ability to be useful and productive directors is limited. When venture capitalists, for example, invest, they reasonably, it seems to me, Expect to have a say in how a company is run, that is, how their money is put at risk, how a return may be achieved. <coughs> you might say that they are buying control, a rolling control, but what is wrong with that? Without some semblance of control, they might not put any cash up. No one might put any cash up. Without the funding, of course, the survival of the company would be at risk. The tension here comes from the director who has multiple allegiances, one of which may well be stronger, or it will be perceived as such, than his allegiance to the common stockholders uh, to whom, by law, she owes the duties of due care and loyalty. In short, the tension between those who put up the latest round of money and are able to negotiate one or more board seats and the stockholders who came before or were lesser investors is palpable. What can be done to eliminate the risk of director liability because of conflicts in this context? Perhaps it is partly a product of my bias or my experience, but certainty in circumstances such as these tends to be illusory. Steps can be taken to reduce the structural risk that I have described, but short of 
owning the entity from the beginning, there is no guaranteed strategy to eliminate the risk. I want to talk about some possible strategies. I take them in no particular order. Uh, their success, of course, will depend upon the specific factual settings. Timing may be critical. If you listen to folks who do what I do for a living, there's always that. It depends upon the facts. It depends upon the circumstances. And for some of you, that may <coughs> seem to be a means of evading the, the core of the issue. It, the reality of it is it does turn on the facts, and these are fact-intensive cases, and any time one tries to generalize, as I am right now, there's a certain risk of you know, creating unwarranted optimism or faith in solutions that are discussed. Alternative entities offer the opportunity to eliminate fiduciary duties. That is expressly authorized by statute. The implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing would still limit what the firm's controllers may do. Also, if governing standards become too complicated, there is a risk that ambiguity will be found. A great deal of uncertainty may result if there is ambiguity, and it's been suggested that one cure for ambiguity in the documents drafted by one side would be to impose the standards and conditions that a reasonable commercial investor on the other side might have anticipated. Whether that's going too far, I don't know. But those are the kinds of issues that you run into if you try to draft documents that deviate from standardly accepted concepts and try to create their own standards. We get very, very complex language. It's dense. It's hard to interpret. And all of a sudden, the effort to mitigate risk creates a whole different set of risks. The law of unintended consequences at work, I guess. Whether the limited liability company or other alternative entity concept will work with a sizable number of investors is another concern. We do have experience with master limited partnerships and how they have worked. Obviously a matter of some debate, uh, but pipeline operators come to mind and they've been around for a while. Uh, a recurring theme seems to be the benefit of limiting the number of investors, especially the common stockholders who hold those residual rights. As an aside, I note the ongoing academic debate about whether the focus uh, in the context of preferred stock should be on the residual rights of the common shareholder or whether value should be viewed in the context of the enterprise as a whole. That is also considering the interests of other, perhaps all, stakeholders. Real-time common sense approaches, some might call them best practices, may also reduce risk. If there are independent and disinterested directors, a special committee might be an option, but that likely would require independent counsel and financial advisors, and all of that costs money. Special committees are held to a high standard, and the process draws scrutiny. And perhaps even worse, it draws skepticism. The special committee must be actively involved. It must be informed, fully functioning. That's a lot harder than what you might think to achieve and to demonstrate. Time and full disclosure can help. Transparency can be good. If the minority holders are presented with what amounts to a fait accompli or the old done deal, suspicions are enhanced. Incomplete, piecemeal, inaccurate, confusing disclosures also drive dissent and negative perception. Appropriate disclosure will not stifle disagreement but if the underlying conduct was reasonable, even if the outcome is not what the minority wanted, the intensity of a response may be moderated. Obtaining approval of a proposed transaction by a majority of the minority on an absolute non-waivable basis is another strategy. That may not have been a viable option in a case such as Traders, where frankly it is hard to understand why the common stockholders would seriously consider supporting a transaction that left them with nothing. Debates about disclosure are easy to frame. There is always more information that could have been disclosed. It may not matter, it may not be material, but there will be a debate, something to fight about, whether the majority of the minority vote mattered and 
achieves its purpose because the shareholders are not adequately informed. A majority also looks good if it works, but a provision like that may not work. What happens if the majority of the minority is no? Then what has been accomplished in terms of supporting what the folks in control were hoping to achieve? Some like fairness opinions. It is easy to have doubts about them. How many good deals have failed for one of a fairness opinion? The lack of a fairness opinion was not fatal in Trados, but it drew attention. The independence, lack of conflict on the part of the financial advisor providing a fairness opinion will be considered. Who has the financial advisor represented in the past or even represents concurrently? What financial interest does the banker have in the parties to the proposed transaction? For an advisor specializing in an industry, avoiding conflicts, uh, especially if major players are involved, may be very difficult. Is the financial advisor conflicted if its compensation is largely dependent on closing the deal? Contingency fees raise questions. Do they eliminate the possibility? No. But it's something that had better be disclosed so that the investors can decide for themselves how valuable or reliable the guidance is. Also, the court has from time to time looked carefully at the analytics used for valuing the business, what amounts to an evaluation of the reasonableness of the work supporting the ultimate recommendation and the fairness opinion can occur. If the analysis has been based on comparable companies, the question of just how comparable likely will be asked. So much of what we do in corporate law is about process. Our focus is on the process much more than the substance of the actual business decision. If the process does not employ the standard protective devices that most anticipate, the action will be more susceptible to and more likely of challenge. Document the transaction. That sounds like simple advice. It is interesting that a lot of times it does not happen. Good minutes that show a knowing and informed board that is focused on correct and important issues will help. The objective is the appearance of regularity, that the board knows what it is doing, knows what standards it is applying, knowing what rules govern its actions. Fiduciaries also need to pay close attention to insurance and indemnification rights. Almost by definition, the entity that is sold is not there to provide advancement and indemnification afterwards. It can get lonely if one is confronted with legal bills that dwarf any benefits obtained through service as a director. Certain frequently recurring problems can be addressed in early documentation, specific provisions, necessarily this something of a piecemeal effort here, may work for problems that can be anticipated. For example, drag-along rights might have helped in the trade scenario. Drag-along rights, as a general matter, require shareholders with respect to a transaction approved by the board or a set of investors to sell their shares, to vote in favor of the transaction, and to give up appraisal rights. Perhaps the suggested remedy would work for a particular problem, but what about the next problem that surfaces that the drafters of the corporate charter or the intervening documents did not anticipate? The closer the drafters drift to altering the fundamental aspects of the corporate dynamic without a statutory safe harbor, the greater the risk that some judge will say no. This is one of those things where creative drafting can minimize risk, may not eliminate it, but trying to anticipate what all the problems are or what the problem that will be specifically encountered by a particular transaction, it's not easy to do. Uh, I have mentioned that fiduciary duties may be limited in alternative entities, but what about corporations? I know that some have suggested that corporate charters might limit fiduciary duties that directors owe to common stockholders perhaps analogizing shareholder rights litigation, venue selection provisions. Lots of things can go in corporate charters. Uh, perhaps there is some room under Section 141 for describing or delimiting the rights of directors. 
I don't know if a limitation on fiduciary duties for directors of corporations would work. Uh, for obvious reasons, I express no definitive view. I confess to a degree of skepticism. Fiduciary duties, as I mentioned a few minutes ago at the outset, are at the core of the relationship between the directors and stockholders of a Delaware corporation. They have a long tradition. Investors expect to be protected by them. If the ownership interests are publicly traded, will the investors know about such restrictions? Perhaps they are charged with knowledge of a publicly filed charter document, but I don't find that to be a particularly satisfying answer. Finally, if fiduciary duties can be eliminated or redefined in the formative document, why do we need such express language that we have in our alternate entity statutes in, to enable the restriction of fiduciary duties? That suggests that maybe in the corporate context it's not so easy to accomplish. Another creative suggestion that I have seen but may also raise significant fiduciary duty questions would be to give large shareholders some sort of a put right. If they can require the company to buy their shares and the company cannot fund the purchase, then going forward with some preordained sale transaction might work. If one offers a way to deal with uh, recalcitrant shareholders through this mechanism, perhaps that's another way to uh, deal with the problems that we have been discussing. Uh, it's new. It may be two cubed by half. Until it's tried, we won't know. Uh, and that's the beauty or the curse of a process based on the common law and the way it evolves, sometimes at a fairly slow pace. Judges are somewhat isolated and necessarily so for the integrity or perceived integrity of the process. Uh, my sense, and I have no empirical data to support this, is that some entrepreneurs, some venture capitalists, and their lawyers are troubled by recent decisions that are seen as not accommodating the corporate governance needs or realities measured in terms of flexibility and with recognition of almost inherent conflicts that we find with startup companies, perhaps speculative, evolving, and financially insecure entities. A reduction in the scope and extent of the duty of loyalty, some suggest, might be appropriate in these circumstances. As I've noted, fiduciary duties are a critical element of Delaware corporate law. They serve time-tested and significant purposes. Those who invest in a corporation are entitled to know that fiduciary duties are there to protect them. This is not the first, nor is it likely to be the last time when controllers of Delaware corporations express frustration with some of the standards by which they must comply. These concerns have a way of working themselves out. Complying with fiduciary duties is not an insurmountable or onerous burden. Planning and forethought may be necessary. Following the proper processes is crucial. I have touched upon some approaches. Not all will work in all circumstances. A few might not work in any circumstances. Yet there are ways to minimize recognized risk. Frustration with judicial decisions is hardly a novel concept. Certainly disagreement with aspects of a few opinions does not warrant a change in how business ventures are structured. Facilitating the investment of capital is a core objective of corporate law. That always should involve sensitivity to the tension between the interests of the enterprise and its sponsoring and participating entrepreneurs and financiers and the rights and reasonable expectations of those who have invested in the enterprise. Those are my thoughts on what can be done, whether something should be done with respect to fiduciary, duty, duty, fiduciary duties in startup enterprises. I would welcome any questions that you might have. If you have any questions, please step to the two microphones.
that's such a, a varied skill set to go from uh, chemical engineering to law. Uh, what was your senior year like in, 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 when you made these decisions? My father said, and I'm probably not being quite fair to him, but this is in essence what he said, if I'm going to pay for your college education, go study something that you can get a job doing. And back when I got out of college, chemical engineering probably was about as employable as any job you could find. I had always wanted to go to law school. And my father's, I, I think he might have been bluffing, but I didn't have the nerve to uh, call his bluff. Uh, and, and that's why I majored engineering instead of economics or political science. I wish I had a more exciting story for you, but it's that simple. <laughs> and, and the other thing which I will say in passing is I, it was an undergraduate major which made law school actually seem easy. Now, those are easy questions. Anybody have a challenging question? I'll volunteer. I don't know if it'll be challenging. Well, you can, you can take the podium and talk for the next 45 <laughs> minutes and people will really be entertained. That's, that's a short lecture, Your Honor. I understand. <laughs> well, I was, trying to, I was trying to keep a cap on it, that's all. One of the important principles that the Delaware judiciary deals with is the notion of entire fairness. And the prototypical case of entire fairness involves a situation where you have one party on both sides of the transaction. All right, so you might look at Southern Peru. Uh, recent decision led to record judgment um, as being an excellent case of a situation where prototypical uh, entire fairness doctrine would apply. But many of the transactions that come up in Silicon Valley don't rise to that level of conflict. Um, the, the, the entire fairness doctrine is a binary switch. It gets turned on and off. It's not like a thermostat where you can go 70 degrees, 71 degrees, 72 degrees. And many of the transactions that sometimes are viewed as problematic don't rise to the level of conflict that you saw in southern Peru. So for example, let's take the case where you've got a stacked bunch of preferences. Um, and in that situation, the general feeling in Silicon Valley is people do try to get the best deal that they possibly can, but what people often fail to recognize from the outside is that the company buying the company that's for sale is aware of the structure of the preferences. And whenever you've got stacked rights in a deal, each one of these cut layers in the stack is going to be a focal point for a price. So for example, let's move away from Silicon Valley. Let's suppose that you've got an insurance policy, a DNO policy, and you're trying to settle a case. All right? Well, you know, you've got the first layer of 10 million, then you've got another layer of five, and then another layer of five over that. And these cases always settle somewhere right in the stack, all right? Because you know that the bargaining energy required to go the next level up, all right, is, is going to be difficult. Is it a breach of a fiduciary duty for the parties to come to a negotiated point, all right, where you're settling just below one level of the stack? You see the same thing in the software industry or the hardware industry, where at the end of a quarter, the salesman knows he's got to make his quota, but the purchaser also knows that the salesman's got to make his quota. So you wind up getting the hockey stick phenomenon, all right, and you wind up seeing deals cut just at certain price points that represent certain discounts, all right? So, so we have much behavior in non-fiduciary, non-entire fairness situations that often tends to mimic behavior that is adjudicated under Delaware law as being subject to the entire fairness doctrine where the nature of the conflict is not as great as the prototypical conflict that causes that switch to be tripped. So I guess this, is, this question is as complicated as the other one was easy, all right, in many ways. Um, and and it, it tries to articulate a precise basis for a certain level of frustration that perhaps some people in Silicon Valley might feel about the need to legitimize certain transactions under the entire machinery of the entire fairness doctrine as applied by Delaware. We start from the premise that fiduciary duties are unremitting. And 
we have a set of tools that can be used to structure a board so that it can make decisions. The, the lesson, if anything, uh, is, and I know it's difficult, but there are ways around it, and independent directors are the most important attribute. And the debate is, can you find independent directors in a place like Silicon Valley where there are networks and everybody knows everybody? And the answer is, I've been told by people who know a lot more about this than I do, that that is possible. It comes at a cost, but if you're looking for a way to avoid entire fairness, or if nothing else, just shift the burden in an entire fairness analysis, which is worth a lot, that can be done through independent directors. Now, where you can't get independent directors, you've simply got to be cautious. You've got to build a record. You've got to explain why you're right. You've got to go through the various mechanisms that are out there, whether it's a fairness opinion, whether it's a majority of the minority, which in a lot of cases, as I pointed out, is not a panacea simply because you may not get the votes. But like so much, when, when you're dealing with a, an equitable principle or set of equitable principles, there is no one right answer. And I'm back to, as I think I alluded to earlier, it turns on the facts. There is no great answer to the problem you have identified. And it may be a, a shortcoming in a sense with the law. Where I struggle is saying, well, this corporation isn't held to the, or doesn't, operate under the same standards as this corporation, which doesn't operate under the same standards as that corporation. The duties have got to be the same. But how one evaluates those duties and assesses them, what they require, they're contextual. And maybe there's a way that the concerns that Professor Grunfest has articulated can be worked into the, the, the determination of what was necessary but again, it's got to be done with some forethought, and the sooner in the process it's done, the more likely it is to be a success. Vice Chancellor, you've really served over these 14 years, I believe it is. Not quite. Not quite, okay. But it, Let's not make me any older than necessary. <laughs> would define as some of the more turbulent uh, uh, times uh, for American and, and, quite frankly, business in general. I wondered at this point in time whether you feel there's more reason to be optimistic or pessimistic, uh, so to speak, uh, regarding the trajectory of corporate governance. I know it's a kind of a very personal opinion, but you, in many ways, are in a place and have served in a time to observe that as as uh, uh, probably as accurately, accurately as anyone. I wish there were a simple answer to that question. Indeed, I almost wish I knew the answer to the question. A couple things. First, what we expect of directors is fairly well known. And day in and day out, most companies are well served by the directors they have. Whether we're going to have a repeat of what happened in 2008 this year, next year, 100 years from now, I don't know when, but human nature being what it is, I think it's inevitable there will be something akin to that happening. Um, greed is a great motivator, and unfortunately it drives a lot of people, and trying to put constraints on folks who would act irrationally trying to encourage the proper conduct, trying to encourage what I would call ethical conduct, trying to get people to do the right thing is not all that easy. So we, we spend a lot more time talking about corporate governance. Um, a, a lot of hard work goes into it, uh, but there was a lot of hard work going into it a decade ago, and we s see what happened. Uh, I'm optimistic that we're getting better at it, whether 
but I'm not optimistic to the sense that we'll eliminate the potential problems. All we can all we can do with these problems is reduce them. They can't be. I'm not sure they're going to be eliminated anytime soon. Chancellor, it was a very good presentation. I liked it. Well, that's nice of you to say that. Um, uh, I'm an entrepreneur and was a professor before. Uh, I have uh, one thing that I have observed in the Silicon Valley and in, in the greater American uh, uh, levels, where the venture capitalists have a portfolio. They raise funds or a uh, pool of funds for a portfolio area, maybe telecom once upon a time, not maybe apps now and energy in some other places. And so their investments are interrelated, either in the supply chain ecosystem or in the same industry. Uh, that's how the funds are uh, uh, pooled and then distributed or invested uh, in the different companies. Now comes the conflict issue, right? They are, they have to, if they do one, it affects the other. Uh, and uh, they may have to uh, also, uh, they may also have uh, seed stage uh, or early stage investments, later stage investments, you know, third or fourth stage investments. So how, how do you think will that play into the conflict issue that you were talking about and fiduciary looking at only that company, not the whole investment? It, it comes back, to, I'm not going to give you a very satisfactory answer because it comes back to the yeah. specific facts and what's going on in a specific transaction or a specific set of transactions. Um, just because a board member is conflicted for some purposes doesn't mean he's conflicted for all purposes. And so you've got to look at each specific sure. setting. You've got to look at each specific enterprise and try to figure out who it is that's making the decisions, who constitutes the board for that investment, and assess whether or not you can find enough people who aren't conflicted. Once you get to a majority being conflicted, then you've got to hope you can find someone who can, or some ones who can serve as a special committee and, and hope that that gets you through the day. Hi, Vice Chancellor. Um, thank you for coming today. I'm a second year law student, and uh, I'm only about eight weeks through corporations, so forgive me if I'm a little imprecise here. But um, it seems like it's important for Delaware to kind of maintain its preeminence. Uh, not only in corporate law, I would imagine also probably in partnership law. Um, is it possible that the Delaware legislature should probably be tackling this question rather than, rather than the judiciary? And they should be doing so by creating maybe a special sort of partnership vehicle that's aimed at the entrepreneurial relationship between people um, with good ideas here in the Silicon Valley and people funding good ideas? And second, this is a little bit more of a facetious question. Um, if Van Gorkum had been offered a million dollars per share, all processed the same, would that case have came out the same? Thanks. As a general matter, there are very few cases where you can say there was so much money offered that that eliminates the inquiry. You can point to a few, or maybe that's what was happening, but it, I don't know that you're going to find cases turning on the raw amount of money that's offered. Uh, the, the question of whether there could be a legislative change, the answer is, of course, there can be a legislative change. Whether that's a good policy idea or a bad policy idea, I tend to think judges ought to stay out of the advising substantive legislative change business. Um, and I, I think that you might be pointed to the alternative entities which go a long way towards addressing the questions of modifying or eliminating fiduciary duties, whether it's a, a limited partnership or a limited liability company. Those are ways to uh, come up with an entity that will not have the problems that we've addressed tonight if, if you think those are problems that need special uh, resolution. The idea that you could have a corporation uh, that is specially set aside for uh, a, a certain group of, or a certain subset of business I think is unlikely. You'd probably have a better chance of developing a new entity that is just 
totally different from a corporation in name so that there's no confusion over what the rights of the investors might be. Good evening, and again, thank you for your speech tonight. I think it was terrific. Uh, just a couple of very quick questions. First, on the Silicon Valley issue, I think there is a perception, at least among some, that the Delaware courts uh, don't quite or have a have a view that there is that Silicon Valley is such a closed community that if you've got a five or seven person board and all of the individuals are from Silicon Valley, either from venture capital firms or Stanford professors or just work in this area, then they are by definition um, conflicted. And I, and I guess I'd like you to first comment on that. Um, just because everybody's from Silicon Valley doesn't establish conflict. You've got to look at the specific business relationships and the specific interests that each might have in the transaction. Just because you're friends, that you do other business together, those aren't necessarily disqualifying. The assessment of someone's independence, we're back to, I hate to keep saying the same thing, it's a factual inquiry. What's at stake? What's the issue? Who, who's, in, who's affected? Who's not affected? And that's how you go about determining independence. So, um, and then the, I appreciate that. Um, I think remember my wonderful case about the guys who own the wineries next to each other. That, to me, was a pretty silly example. But, you know, if you're drafting a complaint, you say what you got to say. So you try. The other part, I think that there's a, a, f a feeling among some here that there's a lack of understanding in, in Delaware is what you're talking about for independent directors. And that is the notion that startups should obtain independent directors. And the reason for that is because independent directors usually re will require some compensation to serve on a board. Startup companies typically do not pay directors to sit on a board. It's not until after a, a company either is about to go public or is in fact a public company that it starts to pay compensation to its directors for being on the board. And I think there's a problem that is discussed almost a structural problem in the Valley, that the notion of paying a director to sit on a board in cash is something that we don't do for companies that are pre-public. Let me go back to what I said. I said finding good directors who are willing to serve is not easy. First, new firms are typically not flush with cash. Directors tend not to work for free. This is a fundamental problem in trying to encourage independents to serve. And I'm not sure I've got a good answer for that. I, one answer I will give you is that the law of corporations, and I don't think this varies a great deal from state to state, is that we value the absence of conflict. And once there is conflict, if you, if, once you realize there's going to be conflict, you've got to come up with a strategy for dealing with it. And, and the other thing that's unfortunate about this is if the enterprise is making lots and lots of money, these problems tend not to be particularly serious. Where we see them, or, 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 or conversely, if the enterprise craters, we don't see it as much. It's where they're kind of left in limbo and some folks want to get out and the time has come to move on and do other things. That's where the tensions really arise and that's what makes Trader such a fascinating case because of the, the dynamics in that case. Uh, so thinking about what you said tonight here um, on a couple topics and about the role of fiduciary duties, it seems to me that fiduciary duty should be serving some sort of normative function in the corporation and guiding uh, director action. Uh, given that the standard for the duty of care is uh, gross negligence and that there is the typically in corporate charters exculpation of liability and DNO insurance, what do you see as the practical value of the duty of care going forward in terms of as a normative you know, function under Delaware law? It helps instruct directors as to their responsibilities and what they have to do. The liability for breach of the duty of care should be rarely imposed because 
using hindsight bias to assess the wisdom of somebody's business judgment is not terribly fair because there's always that assumption, well, you, you took strategy A and it didn't work. If you taken strategy B, it would have worked. Well, I, I don't know about you, but that logic doesn't move me very far, but that is a natural reaction to it. Uh, so demonstrating that a director was grossly negligent is very difficult. The cases tend to focus on loyalty. And if, you've, if you're not conflicted, you're not going to find courts second guessing you that much. And that's what the business judgment rule is about. So in order to impose liability for a bad business decision, it's very difficult. And I think it will be. But at the same time, saying that it's a duty you have to comply with, it's it's something to remind the board of its function because it's not merely a, a, a bunch of loyal folks who don't know anything about what they're doing, but you've got to work at the job, you've got to educate yourself, you've got to exercise a rational decision-making process, and you've got to be informed to you make the decision. And there's nothing wrong with trying to uh, reinforce that set of values. Yes, sir. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, do you adjudicate uh, uh, fiduciary responsibilities of not-for-profit directors? And what, if you do, what kind of cases do you come across? They're part of our jurisdiction. Um, I cannot remember a case involving a, a charitable not-for-profit corporation. I don't think I've had one. And they, they don't come up very often, but uh, most times when you see litigation involving that, there's something that, it's, it, it, yes, is it a breach of fiduciary duty? Yes, but is it something worse than that? Is somebody's dipping the till or uh, getting self, uh, getting benefits out of the, out of the charity that, that shouldn't be gotten in the first place. It's, it's almost theft more than anything else. I think my hook is showing up. <laughs> you don't mind your holiness? I think you are absolutely Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Another big round of applause because look at the bright side. The chancellor's wife walked out on him only once. It was a good speech. It was a good speech. Thank you all very much. Wow.